and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. The text for our thought on this, the Passion Sunday, Palm Sunday, is recorded in Luke chapter 23, verses 13 to 16. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. So far, our text. Your friends in Christ, especially our young friends who have joined us today, thank you very much for blessing us uh, with your voices and the talent that God has given you. Just a little background, I have spent a lot of time in Missouri, uh, 20 years there going to seminary, and then I was pastor at Hope Lutheran Church in St. Louis for 12 years, and then Ascension uh, Lutheran, uh, Lutheran Church, actually in St. Louis 16 years, excuse me, and then four and a half years in Kansas City at Ascension, and I'm familiar with St. Paul's College. I'd had a leg broken and a foot broken and operated on, and I got to go to a pastor's conference, and lo and behold, the conference is at one end of the campus, and the meals and everything were at the other end of the campus. And, and that's a lot of fun on crutches. Uh, but one of the other pastors had mercy upon me and allowed me to uh, ride with his Jeep. But part of that is, is why I was in St. Louis, I was with the uh, St. Louis Police Department, I was with the Kansas City SWAT team, and here I am a chaplain with the El Paso County Sheriff's. What I'm saying that is, over these years, I have come to know a lot of policemen. And maybe I should probably say, being politically correct, police persons, though that kind of sounds strange. Uh, and knowing most of us are really pretty guilty of something, and having learned to believe, disbelieve about 90% of them, cops still manage to be, keep uh, a unique perspective on life. Allow me to share a few stories with you. Consider that this is a true story of one of our officers who is placed uh, on uh, patrol duty doing traffic. And we all like them, don't we? Especially when you're driving down the street and you go by them. The first thing you do is step on your brakes, take a deep breath, and then check your speedometer. Well, this officer had placed himself in the perfect place where they always stop a lot of people. And they were, he sat there for an hour, he sat there for another hour, and he wasn't catching anybody. And they always catch people there. Well, he raided in, and the little investigation seemed to show what was the problem. It seems that there was a 10-year-old boy who a couple blocks further up the street was standing there by a tree, and he had a great big sign holding up that he was holding up, and he said, Speed trap ahead! Slow down! And then they investigated a little further. On the other side of that police car, down the road, they had a corner and a light. There was a young friend, an accomplice, standing there holding out another big sign that said, tips received for pointing out the speed trap. And he had a bucket and was filled with a whole lot of dollar bills and some change. And he was collecting. And, and what he showed is that you don't have to be an old person to do something wrong. Now, the police get to hear and see it all. I know of another policeman who, while he was on patrol, saw a vehicle just go ripping through a traffic light. I mean, he was sitting there, it was green, she was fully red. Boom, she went through. She didn't even slow down. She didn't even touch the brakes. She just blew right by that police car and right through that red light. So what did he do? He turned on the popcorn ma maker on the top. All the lights went over and pulled her over. And he said, did you see that light? She says, yes. And she says, but I have an explanation. She says, what's that? I just had my car worked on. I just had to replace all of the brakes on the car, and it cost me a ton of money. It's really expensive. So I decided not to use my brakes to save money. She'd gone 80 miles an hour and went through that light. There was another man. He was going down the road. Traffic cop picks him up. He's going 80 mile an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone. He went after him. This man finally pulls over. He comes to him. And he says, Officer, I know I've been always going fast, but I had a bee in my car 
And I knew that a bee couldn't fly faster than 80 miles an hour, so I had to go real fast so he wouldn't sting me. Sign here. All of them knew they had done something wrong. One policeman that I know was personally involved in this incident. Seems two men late at night decided to steal from an ATM machine. But they decided to do it in a different way. They didn't want to break into the machine, that'd be obvious. So they went and put a chain onto the machine, into the wall, hooked it up to the truck, then took off the truck to jerk the machine away. What's well, reinforced? It didn't come out of the wall. It broke some of the, the concrete, broke some of the bricks, but it yanked the, the bumper right off of that truck, and they left and got away. But you know what they left behind? Their license plate on the truck and a bumper sticker, and they got arrested for trying to break into that machine. And they caught up with them, but, and we think about it, we're just saying, I'm not going to be that foolish. I'm not going to go blowing through a red light you know, not touching the brakes. I'm not going to try to outrun a bumblebee inside my car. I'm not going to try to take an ATM machine off a wall and leave my license plate behind. But we know that we're all guilty of doing something. Let's say this together. We all have done something wrong. Say it. We have all done something wrong. And you know it. You don't have to be a policeman to know that's true. It was probably about 10 years ago that one of my former members, as a special surprise for his wife, bought some flowers. And he didn't do this very often, on a very rare occasion, in fact. But this time he decided he wasn't going to come in, park his car in the garage, come into the house, set it on the vase and all that. He decided he wanted to really surprise her, so he brought the flowers. He went around to the front door, he rang the doorbell and waited, and he rang it again, waited. She finally opened it with an exasperated look on her face, and she looked at him, she looked at the flowers, looked at his great romantic smile, and she says, Honey, the baby has a touchy stomach, the washing machine broke this morning, and your son got into a fight in school with another boy, and was, I had to go pick him up because he was suspended, and now you're standing here with a stupid grin on your face because you came home drunk. Because she knew, let's say it, we have all done something wrong. She knew that. Now, when it came to Jesus, it was that same principle that motivated the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. From the time Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, they had been conspiring on how to get rid of Jesus. They knew that Jesus had done something wrong. They brought in witnesses against Jesus. And even though the witnesses were paid, and even though they were coached, they couldn't agree. And in spite of that embarrassing turn, the Sanhedrin had managed to railroad the Christ and condemn him to death. You see, Jesus had done something wrong as far as they were concerned, Jesus' wrong was his claiming to be the only Son of God. To them, to the Sanhedrin, Jesus' words were blasphemy, speaking falsely against God. And you can hardly blame them. If any of us, if anybody else in all of human history had made the claim to be the only Son of God, it would be a blatant, bald-faced, total, 100% lie. But when Jesus said it, it was the truth. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was sent to earth so that we might be saved from sin and death and, and Satan. Jesus as you remember, was born in, of a virgin in Bethlehem. And then Jesus, all of his life, all of his years, were passed in perfection. But even yet, and even so, Jesus was condemned to death. Because the people remembered, we have what? All done 
something wrong. And Jesus had done something wrong, according to them. But having won a dreadful and dishonorable victory, the Sanhedrin had only one little small kind of technical problem. Because of the Roman occupation, they no longer had the authority to carry out a death sentence. The law said that those who were convicted of blasphemy were to be stoned to death. Yet the Jewish leader knew that the Roman procreator, Pontius Pilate, would never allow a man to be executed for something as tiny, as trivialing, as trivial as blasphemy against a non-Roman god. They didn't care. And, but even more worrisome than Pilate were the crowds which only a few days before on this Palm Sunday, had welcomed the Messiah into Jerusalem. They would not be pleased if the religious leaders underhandedly assassinated the son of David, the one who had come in the name of the Lord. So there was a problem. Pilate was the only one who could pronounce the sentence and carry it out, and the crowds wanted Jesus as Messiah. Still, the Sanhedrin knew all of this, and everybody, they knew, so one other thing, because they knew human beings, they knew, let's say it again, everyone has done something wrong. All they had to do then, they thought in their mind, was find another charge, a charge which would hold up in a Roman court. And that is why they dragged Jesus then before Pontius Pilate, and they changed the charges. They accused him then of subverting the nation. They said Jesus had started a tax revolt, that he was trying to overthrow the emperor. And those last two items, encouraging people not to pay taxes to Caesar uh, and attempting to overthrow the government, must have really got Pilate's attention. In the last months, he'd had some public relations problems with his boss in Rome, Pilate had. He was no longer in favor of the emperor, and when you fell into fell out of favor with the emperor when you got fired from your job. It was a permanent thing because they put you to death. That's kind of a thing. You can't go back to work there anymore. So he dared not let any kind of an insurrectionist slip through his hands. Now, Scripture, as we looked at today, records, you know, Pilate's kind of fancy footwork to avoid making the decision against Jesus. He took Jesus away from them who were accusing him, and he had a private investigation. He looked at him, and he came out, and he says, I have examined him, I've looked at him, and he has done nothing wrong. But yet he knew that the people would cry out because everyone has done something wrong. I've done something wrong. You've done something wrong. What a question, though. What if you were asked, what have you done wrong? What if you were asked that? Maybe you have been. It's like this. This past year, a mother of three small boys told me how she'd had a similar problem, a question. She had found proof that one of her children had broken one of the rules in the house. So she you know, questioned them, and she said, okay, which of you guys have done something you weren't supposed to do? Well, that line of interrogation, she hoped would produce a confession, but it didn't. It's like your parents come to you and say, all right, did you do this or did you do it? You know, it's always my brother's fault, right? You know, we had a couple of people live in our house, not me and I don't know. Did you do that? Not me. Do you know who did it? I don't know. Now, I've got to find those culprits. But she did said, looked at them, and they asked each of the boys in turn, did you do it? Not me, Mom. I didn't do anything wrong. Those were the responses that she kept receiving. So evening came, and she put the boys to bed, and then she had prayers with them. And just as she's going to turn out the light, she says, Well, now, boys, I'm going to bed, and when I do in my prayers, I'm going to ask God who broke the rules. Don't you think one of you want to tell me right now before I ask God? And it was silent, and she waited. And after a little while, a voice comes out of the darkness. Well, I don't know. We're going to wait to see what God says. All of us have what? Done something wrong. 
Do you know that's why the United States Senate passed a law a few years ago in 1988? They passed a law which said employers could not give their people a lie detector test without a good reason. It's interesting because it's saying that the Senate knew something perhaps better than anybody else. They knew that everybody has what? Done something wrong. Would you like to put a lie detector test to the politicians today? Now let's face something. You've done something wrong. I'm not going to get specific, but you've done something wrong. You've not said it to anybody else, but you know it, don't you? You know it specifically. You know what you've done wrong, and you may hide it from your parents. You may hide it from your spouse. You may hide it from your children. You may hide it from your boss. You may hide it from your pastor, your closest friends. But inside, you know. You know, no matter what anybody else thinks, that you most certainly have broken God's laws, and you've probably broken some man-made laws as well. But if you look inside and you think about it, you know you have done something wrong. And knowing that is true for everybody, Pontius Pilate felt secure in asking Jesus that question. What have you done wrong? Pilate was, in a sense, throwing out a great big net. He was trying to get a confession. Now, you need to know that if Jesus had done something wrong, he couldn't have been God's only son. If Jesus had done something wrong, he couldn't be the Savior. If Jesus had done something wrong, if he had violated even one of the smallest of the commandments, then he's just like us, and he's also worthy of being condemned and not worthy of being praised. If Jesus had done something wrong, he was a sinner. And sinners don't rise from the dead. Sinners don't save other people. If Jesus had done something wrong, then our faith in him is misplaced. He's a liar. Now remember, if Pilate had asked a similar question of us, what have you done wrong? Being real honest, we'd have to hang our head and we'd have to say, I've sinned. If I went and asked your friends, people who normally overlook your shortcomings, if I asked them what you've done wrong, probably they could give me a list. If I went and asked your enemies, they'd give me a longer list, and they'd make up some. And even the Mother Teresa, who was looked at by many people as a saint, she would have to say, I've sinned. The world's greatest leaders, the most gentle of mothers, the kindest of doctors have to confess I have sinned. That's because we have all violated the laws of God with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions. And Scripture is quite correct when it says, there is no man on the earth that does only good and never sins. And that's true except for Jesus. So the Sanhedrin looked for something that he had done wrong. They weren't able to find it. Jesus' enemies found nothing. Pilate, who approached the situation with a whole different set of standards, a different set of pri priorities, was not able to find anything. His political career and his life well hinged on the fact that he had to find something wrong. But Pilate came up with zip, not a nothing. No matter who looked, the conclusion was always the same. Jesus has committed no crime. He's had no sin. He's done nothing time and time again 
and then Pilate says it, Jesus is innocent. I find no basis for the charges. He's done nothing deserving of death. Jesus has, in Pilate's words, done nothing. But then you would expect, if you didn't know the end of the story, having come to this conclusion, Pilate would release Jesus. You might expect something like that to happen, but you'd be wrong. Innocent Jesus, who had done nothing, was punished. Innocent Jesus, who had done nothing, carried a cross up to the hill and was crucified. Innocent Jesus, being the man who had done nothing wrong, was nailed to that cross and then hung in the hot sun to die. The crowds had welcomed him into Jerusalem five days before were silent, and they were replaced by those who were pleased to see his pain, who smiled at his suffering, who were happy to see him hurting, who delighted in his dying, yet as humankind was doing its worst, God was doing his best. You see, Pilate had it wrong. Jesus had done something. He had done a great many things. He had healed the sick. He would restored sight to the blind. He had voiced to those who couldn't speak, hearing to the deaf. He had even raised the dead. He had done all these things, but he had done nothing wrong, and now he was dying for us. On this trip, I just was in Florida. I was at the store. I saw a couple of three-year-old boys doing what three-year-old boys normally do, standing in line at the grocery store. They were fighting at each other. They were yelling at each other. They were pushing at each other. They were going at it. And, and one turns to the other. The younger says, I hate you. And the older comes back and says, well, that's okay. I hate you more. Well, realizing she lost control, the mother looked at him and says, boys, you don't talk that way to each other. We don't do that. And, you know, we were going to go to McDonald's, and I'm not going to take two young men. I'm not going to take any boys who are, act that way and hate each other to McDonald's. Now, what do you have to say? Well, the younger one, recognizing that superior intellect of his mother, looked at his older brother and says, well, you know, I don't really hate you. And the other one looked at him and says, well, I'm not hungry. I still hate you. <laughs> That's because what? We have all done something wrong, except for Jesus. Jesus did everything right, and this is the one thing that he did. He loved you more that can never be measured. Even before you were born, Jesus loved you. Even right now, even though you've done something wrong, he still loves you. Even though you haven't confessed it, he still loves you. Even though only you know what you have done wrong, he still loves you. Even though you're going to go out and make more mistakes, he's going to continue to love you. And if you know that, Give thanks. If you don't, don't hold back. Don't drag your feet. The Holy Spirit's calling you. Believe in Jesus. You see, Jesus did everything right. Is that you can be made right. That's what Jesus has done. It's enough. It's everything. Now God's people can say, Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Regard your hearts and minds in faith in Jesus Christ to life everlasting with him. Amen.